Welcome to the regular fourth meeting of the 2014 Cape Elizabeth Town Council. <clears throat> May we have the roll call by the town clerk. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Wagner? And Councilor Walsh? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Before uh, we begin the evening, there are a few chairs up front, and if people would please make sure the alleys are clear behind the seating areas so that when the public hearing takes place, people will be able to come to the podium, podium easily. And I want to remind everyone that not only is there a fire exit in the back, but there's also one here. Could we have town council reports and correspondence? Council Jordan. Um, just to let the public know that we have two openings within the town, one on the Personnel Appeals Board and one on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and we are accepting applications for those positions until Monday, March 24th. So please take a look. You can find all the information on the town website. Councilor Sherman. Uh, the uh, Town Center Plan Committee uh, met this afternoon from 4 to 6, uh, and uh, we are making progress on preparing our report, and part of the process will include getting uh, public feedback on the draft report, but we are very hopeful that we'll comply with the new deadline of June of this year to complete our work. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? I'd like to thank the Public Works Department for their continued efforts uh, in the face of a very difficult winter. <laughs> so thanks again to Public Works. Uh, can we have the Finance Committee report? Uh, there is no report this evening. Number, uh, item number 50 on tonight's agenda is the town manager's referral of the uh, 2015 budget to this committee, and I will defer to that. Thank you, Councilor Walsh. Anyone else? Next item is an opportunity for citizens to, to discuss an item that is not on tonight's agenda. There is a three minute limit per person. Is there anyone wishing to do that? Okay, I see no one. Could we have the town manager's report? Uh, thank you, I'll pass this evening and I, I think I, what I'll do is a written summary by the end of the week and we'll post that online as well. Okay, thank you. The next item is a review of our draft minutes of the February 10 council meeting. Uh, I, do I have a motion to accept the February 10 minutes? So council, moved. Councilor Sherman, is there a second? Seconded. Council Walsh, are there any uh, comments or corrections? Any discussion? Is there um, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Before we open the public hearing, I would like to uh, acknowledge that our police chief Williams is here and present. Also the uh, attorney representing the town on the issue, attorney Cole is here. And I would like to uh, remind members of the audience that we are to conduct ourselves with civility and respect Hello, Jean. so that all citizens can uh, speak to their points and Excuse, would you please record the arrival of Council Wagner? <laughs> anyway, to, to listen respectfully to all citizens. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Wagner, as you're a recused from this item, would you please join the audience? I didn't even get to listen to the initial reports. Take the budget and study that. You can leave it here, too. We will now begin the public hearing. Uh, there is a three-minute limit 
to each citizen coming to the podium. If you would, in the interest of time, if you would please line up along the back wall and on the sides so that we can proceed. Um, and so I now declare the public hearing open. My name is James Richard. I live at Nine Cross Hill Road in Cape Elizabeth. I've been asked by the residents of Cross Hill uh, to make a statement. Um, our prime concerns with the ordinance at hand, Chapter 24, first one is safety. Since the prime mandate of any town is to provide for the safety and welfare of its citizens, uh, in the town's 53-year history of issuing a license to the Spurwing Target Range, the town has never conducted a safety inspection of the range. Upon request, the only documentation of the town produced of an inspection was from 1996. It consisted of a survey by a landscape architect firm of the range property, accompanied by a trajectory drawing prepared by one of the Spurwing Gun Club members, and was commissioned by Juan Perez to gain planning board approval for the Dominus Crossing, quote, Cross Hill subdivision. Though numerous petitions to the town have been made for an independent safety inspection, they have all been ignored. The town has failed to meet a fair and reasonable standard to provide protection for its citizens for allowing the range to operate, having never been determined that they meet a national safety standard to do so. What we are asking the town to do is basically have a safety inspection of the range by an independent body that would show that they meet national safety standards. Since it is the mandate of the town and they are obliged to provide for the safety of the citizens. The next issue is the disturbance of the peace ordinance, which is chapter 12. Chapter nine is the discharge of firearms. The town is of the opinion that chapter nine, discharge of firearms, just negates chapter 12, disturbance of the peace. Um, it's apparent that the neighbors strongly disagree with this, citing the provisions of MRSA 30-30011, as outlined in Mr. Langdorf's letter to the Council of February 6, 2014. We, our issues here are that the town has an ordinance of disturbance of the peace from 1941 that we cannot get any answer to as to why that ordinance is not enforced <coughs> against the Spurwink Gun Club since the ordinance predates the establishment of the target range and MRSA 30-3001 does provide for implementation of nuisance ordinances that were in existence prior to the establishment of a firing range. Though the May 27th, excuse me, the March 27th, 1961 letter from the town selectman clearly states permission to establish a supervised target range on their land at Sawyer Road, the town is unable to provide any documentation that the range has ever been supervised, either by the town or by the Spurwink Gun Club. Mr. Marion, the ex-club president, has stated such records do not exist. Chapter 24, Article 13 of the proposed ordinance is one that we have our biggest problem with, which is exceptions. It allows the town to selectively negate, with unlimited discretion, any and all of Chapter 24's provisions as they apply to the Spurwink Rodden Gun Club. This constitutes, in my opinion, bias, which in turn violates the constitutional rights of equal protection and due process. Thank you. I'll have the next guy behind me read it. Councilors, uh, my name is Robert Haar. I live at Hobstone in Cape Elizabeth. Your, your last name, please. Haar, H-O-R-R. -R. Thank you. Uh, I am a member of the Spurwink uh, Rod and Gun Club. And uh, I'd like to uh, just, just make some comments about the ordinance. So on the surface, it may make sense to develop an ordinance for shooting ranges that may be founded in Cape Elizabeth in the future. The application of this particular ordinance to the Spurwing uh, Rod and Gun Club, I, I'm opposed to. So the club has made a significant progress to develop solutions to the concerns of the neighboring communities, not just Cross Hill, at its own expense and at the resources of its members. I suggest that the council and the town of Cape Elizabeth let discussions continue between reasonable representatives from all Cape communities and the Spurwink <coughs> Rod and Gun Club, excuse me. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Carl Best. I live at 12 Pond View, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I just wanted to say I've been a member of the Rod and Gun Club now for almost two years. Um, I am not a hunter. However, I enjoy the sport of shooting, as does my son. And uh, it's an activity that uh, we enjoy together. And uh, we found that the club affords us uh, the opportunity to do that in a, in a pretty strict and responsible fashion. And that, uh, that was a very big factor in uh, determining my, my membership there. Um, made a lot of friends there. I've learned a lot. I've introduced some friends to the club. And uh, by all means, if anyone has any questions or any interest whatsoever, I'd invite you to stop into one of our meetings and see what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jeff Moen. I live at Tupon View, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm an active duty military member. Uh, moved to the, uh, the area here about two and a half years ago. And being a military member, being stationed in many different places, um, coming here, being able to find a place to um, take my son and teach him hunting that I grew up with in South Dakota. Um, he also was a member of the uh, youth shooting team at the club, and he's got great experience and, and uh, has learned lots of uh, excellent skills and uh, was able to uh, get his uh, first deer this year. So it was, it was a great thing um, for me as a father to have that experience with my son at the shooting range. I also want to say that I've been to many of the, um, the ordinance council meetings, and I am impressed and appreciate the work that you guys put forward and the time that you took uh, to looking at all sides of the ordinance. So I appreciate your time on that, and thank you. Thank you. I'm Daniel Price from 53 Cross Hill Road. Um, I also want to say that I'm a father, and I have uh, two daughters and one son, and I enjoy doing many things with them. Um, and I'm concerned right now that the town council is not interested in making sure that they are safe in their own neighborhood. Um, I want to continue with what was being read by uh, Mr. Richard earlier, uh, and is a statement from uh, a group of citizens and residents of Cape Elizabeth who live in um, the Cross Hill area. In addition, Chapter 24, Article 13 essentially grants an ill-defined variance of undue hardships to the Spurwink target range as it pertains to Chapter 24. The Maine Supreme Court has stated in numerous cases that the test for undue hardship is a very strict one and very difficult to meet. Variances for undue hardships are supposed to be granted sparingly. They are the exception rather than the rule. Further, the courts in Maine have established rules relating to non-conforming uses, which state in part, quote, the spirit of zoning ordinances is to restrict rather than to increase any non-conforming uses and to secure their gradual elimination. Accordingly, provisions of a zoning regulation for the continuation of such uses should be strictly construed and provisions limiting non-conforming uses should be liberally construed. The right to continue a non-conforming use is not a perpetual easement to make a use of one's property detrimental to his neighbors. That was Lovely versus Zoning Board of Appeals in Presque Isle, um, 259A2D666, which is a little ominous. Um, Shackford and Gooch, Incorporated versus Town of Kennebunk, 486. It goes on to state, quote, non-conforming uses are a thorn in the sides of proper zoning and should not be perpetuated any longer than necessary. That's also from Lovely, Supra, and Frost. Um, and I, I guess I, we want to uh, continue to say that uh, the undue hardship uh, uh, clause in the current, um, in the current proposed um, legislation is concerning. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no details as to how undue hardship would be determined, uh, and it is concerning that the, the gun club could claim undue hardship and therefore not meet safety regulations as uh, described by the town, and that's concerning to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Herbert Denison, 63 Sprawling Avenue. And I guess I start out by a, a past member of the Rod and Gun Club and also a charter member of it. I haven't been active for years, but the people in Cross Hill, not to downgrade them, but they knew it was there. If they didn't, they should be seeing their relatives. All I know about it is what I've read in the papers, and this council wasn't going to be involved when this first came to light a couple of years ago, and now we've got the town attorney in and these audiences. I don't see any reason for having to suddenly having to license it every year so the town can get a few pennies. I think safety is the most important thing, and I think the Rod and Gun Club and its members throughout the year have proven their safety. It's been a, a local police department and neighboring police departments that's used their range. And yes, it's noisy. I was born and brought up down to two lights. Foghorn would blow quite a lot, a lot of times, sometimes two weeks straight. You learn to live with the noise. It might be an annoyance, but the people should have known it when they bought it. If they didn't, they should see their elders. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Ted Stroney. I live at 82 Excuse Hunts me, Point. Your last name again, please. Stroney, S T R O J N Y. I live at 82 Hunts Point Road, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I've lived in Maine for about four and a half years, been a member of the gun club for three. Since that time, I've noticed that the people there are very conscientious, responsible. Uh, the gun club itself is concerned with rules, regulations, and above all, safety. They've made vast improvements since I've been there, based on the budget that's available. And I think that just because some people consider this an issue doesn't mean it is an issue. Uh, the club has been self-regulating for 60 years now, as I, as I understand, and, and there's been no real problems. Um, I feel that the creation of an ordinance would be both cumbersome and create ill will. Uh, and also is unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Walter Marrier, and I'm from South Portland. Could you repeat your last name, please? Marrier, M-A-R-I-E-R. -E um, I moved there 30 years ago. And the reason I'm from South Portland and I'm speaking is um, I, I hunt archery. And I used to hunt the power line that is just before Cross Hill and the gun range. And I only hunted the right-hand side all the way down to the end where the pond is. I mean, even I knew not to go on the other side because there was a gun range there. Now today, on my way in here, I happened to drive by. I never really paid attention to it. But they're, they're not even two-tenths of a mile from our range. These people did not buy a house with a gun range down the street. They bought a house with a gun range in their backyard. Now, speaking as a person who grew up with a sand pit in my backyard, I heard a lot of noise. It wasn't a bad quality of life. I mean, the machinery banging around, and then when they weren't there, the gunshots going off. <coughs> I'm ADHD, so I've got to slow down. Um, <laughs> uh, when I did hunt over there um, near Cross Hill, um, it was hunting season. So that's the time when people would be sighting their guns in for hunting season. So it would probably, I would assume that it would be more active over there. And I am a member of the club. And um, I never got freaked out. I mean, I heard the guns, but like I said, I grew up hearing guns. The targets were 100 yards from my head. I mean, but still, that's the ADHD. I'm going on and on. Um, but, um, you know, somebody that I, I heard another gentleman say it. I mean, it's buyer's remorse. I mean, whoever, when, when my wife bought her house, she knew where the high school was, where the schools were, the bus line was. Everyone asked these questions. And when you have a gun range down Old Street, you're probably going to ask the guy you're buying the house from, um, how bad is the gun range? And I'm sure he said, it's not that bad. And I haven't heard anyone here say, uh, talk about before our gun range, before this community moved in here, Cross Hill, 
We had many matches down there. Now, this is what I've been told because I wasn't a member then, but we had matches down there, big bore matches, the local Greater Portland Area Police Department's train down there. <clears throat> and to be a good neighbor, we stopped that. If we'd have kept that going a couple of years and then stopped it, maybe the people at Cross Hill would understand that the noise has gone down immensely. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Kramer Howe, and I live at 9 Steeplebush Road in Cross Hill, over on the other end. So I don't hear quite as much noise as some of the folks over on the Spurwing Garden Rod and Gun Club end. But um, what I want to share with you and I, it is we, we have been there for 12 years. I believe Cross Hill was built about 14 years ago because we had to wait for about two years before we could buy the parcel of land that we wanted. Um, we have enjoyed our area very, very much. And it has only been within the last, I would say, two to three years where there has been a significant change in the weapons that are being fired. And my husband Bob and I would say, would hear a pop and another pop the last year or two, and we would say, well, that's okay. You know, that noise is, is acceptable. But then we would hear weapons that sounded like semi-automatic. And they were loud and they were frightening. And they, they were very disturbing. I feel as though we need to compromise with the folks from the Rod and Gun Club. And I feel as though we can compromise. I, can't, I don't see why we can't live in harmony as we did 10, 12, 13 years ago when the weapons were smaller, they weren't as loud. And I imagine they were safer then as well. So I ask that in the art of compromise and negotiation, we try to create a win-win for both sides of this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Brett, I live at 7 Steeplebush Road, also in Cross Hill. And I just would plead for common sense. I got a bunch of little kids that are running all over the neighborhood. I don't really hear the noise that much up in Steeplebush, but I worry about their safety. Cape Elizabeth, uh, you know, through the planning board, approved the development of Cross Hill however many years ago. And I would just look for them now to make sure that the safety of the residents that live there is assured. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Mayone. I'm the uh, former president of Spurwink Ron and Gun Club, and I am the gentleman who is also the co-chair of the No Blue Sky Committee. Uh, that is the, pro the new range design that our club is going to be installing over the next couple of years. First off, I appreciate your difficult position for being between the neighbors and ourselves. Um, in the past 20 years, our club has approximately the same amount of members that we've had. We've not expanded, but the neighborhood has expanded. Um, in recent years, we've completed a long list of modernization, regardless of the outcome of this ordinance, uh, proposed ordinance. We're going to continue on doing what we're doing to modernize and upgrade the club. Um, ideally, licensing is the big issue here. We have a good standing license uh, to operate that has not been suspended and it hasn't been revoked. Uh, having us relicense would be tantamount to having a homeowner reapply for our occupancy permit 60 years after receiving an initial one from the town. And that's the way that many of our members feel. We believe we can accomplish everything the town, the club, and the neighbors want by going into a workshop and writing into chapter 9 where we already are, um, uh, chapter 9 of the Code and Ordinances, uh, what the interested parties are all wanting. 
Uh, as long as that doesn't change who we are or what we've done over the past 60 years, uh, this should streamline the whole process of getting everything done that everyone wants done. Gentlemen want safety, we want safety. We want it as much as, as everyone because not only do we want to not bother our neighbors, but we want to have a club also that continues on. Um, as far as noise goes, part of the new range design incorporates a third of the cost of the range design, which is in tens of thousands of dollars. A third of that is sound mitigation. Um, you, to do it correctly, you have to design the range in a symbiotic relationship with the sound design, with the sound mitigation stuff. So that's something that we're going to do for the neighbors. We don't get anything for that, except money not spent on other stuff. The neighbors get a benefit, we don't. Uh, and that's something that the neighbors have to realize that's going to take time. They have to trust in us because we've shown that when we've said we were going to do something, we've done it. And I think the neighbors also have to give us a little breathing space and admit, okay, we're part of this problem too because we built here. So we accept some of the responsibility here. And that's all we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Tammy Walter. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm the president of Spurwink, the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Uh, we've made many improvements to our club, including substantial uh, enhancements during the past few years. We've added a secure electronic gate control to monitor range usage, video monitoring, extended fencing and signage, sound suppress suppression insula insulation in the shooting shed, and massive range barrier wall with sound dampening. We did this for the good of our members and our community. Some of these improvements were made specifically for the good of our neighbors at substantial cost to us. The cost was in, in the tens of thousands of dollars in labor and materials. Enacting this ordinance and requiring us to go through a complete site planning and relicensing process will put a financial burden on our club. A better use of our limited resources would be to allow us to continue with our current upgrade and modernization project. Yet, if this measure passes, our funds may need to be spent simply to satisfy the new code. Therefore, we ask that you do not pass the proposed shooting range ordinance. Having said that, we are aware that there's a great, deal of a great deal of pressure has been brought to bear on the town council by some of our neighbors for you to do something. You have been thrust into the middle and charged with the task of trying to find a solution. The Spurwink Rod and Gun Club wants to express our sincere appreciation for all your hard work. For the benefit of everyone, we will continue upgrading and improving our shooting range. We have heard in the past that our neighbors were willing to assist financially in these efforts, but yet we, ha we have yet to see any donations. We estimate that extending the shooting shed to fully contain all the shooting positions, adding two additional baffled barrier walls, and adding cross-range baffles to fully mask the sky and prevent even the remotest possibility of a bullet leaving the range would cost in the neighborhood of $87,000. We look forward to any earnest assistance in these efforts from our neighbors or anyone else. We hope that whatever the outcome of this process, that we can ultimately coexist with our neighbors. Thank you very much on behalf of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, John Baldwin. I live at 47 Cross Hill Road. <clears throat> and I think they do have the funds to do this. A $500 co capital contribution to a club by the 300 members would give them well over $300,000 to make the upgrades. These upgrades should be, they should want more than anyone else because it will bring the fact that they haven't invested at all in the club the last 30 years up to speed to a, a, at a very least a minimum standard let alone uh, a higher standard to set a, a reasonable goal for the club. If you go to other gun ranges in Maine, th they're part of the community and very much want to 
participate and make an effort. All we've heard is the gun club pushing sides, making everyone on each side to and want to start a fight, which is not right. And uh, so I, I think they do have the funds to make these upgrades, and it, there isn't a hardship issue. So. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? I'd ask again for people to line up. I mean, it's, it's going to be a long evening. We want to make sure everyone has an opportunity. So anyone else wanting to speak, please line up along the wall. <laughs> My name is Ralph Romano. I live at 12 Tiger Lily. Um, I've heard the Rod and Gun Club say that they're going to make improvements. Well, I think that's an admission that there are improvements to be made, that the current standard that they are operating under is insufficient. I'm not really moved by the fact that they say that it would cost a lot of money to do it. Uh, we're talking about safety here. Safety is an important issue. I don't believe that an unsafe operation can or should be grandfathered. The noise thing, I mean, it's annoying and everything. And, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that have objections, but that seems like somewhat of a separate issue. But I don't think anybody's going to argue or can argue that safety is something that should be compromised. One of the things under the, uh, I was reading the ordinance and everything, and it's, it's an interesting ordinance, and it appears on the surface to have some merit to it. But like others in the neighborhood, I've read it, and the exemptions make it almost toothless. Uh, it is too easy for people to ask for a hardship exemption. The firing range committee seems stacked against anybody who would bring a complaint because at least two, maybe three members of the committee out of five would represent the interest of the Rod and Gun Club. So I don't think neighbors will ever get a fair hearing on their complaints. The other thing that, that kind of interests me is the uh, liability insurance. The town has asked for $3 million, which to some people might sound like a lot of money, but uh, you know, the, the cost of settlements today <laughs> rises all the time and three million dollars does not sound like a lot of money and there's no specific language in here about when that three million dollar insurance policy should be in place i think it should be in place immediately before the club is allowed to operate anymore now they may claim it's a hardship to get the three million dollar policy that it's expensive but i would argue that it's probably expensive if their operation is unsafe and doesn't meet standards. If they have a safe operation and it meets standards, they should be able to get it insured. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Byron Castro and I live at 185 Fowler Road. Could you repeat, I'm sorry, could you repeat your last well, name? Castro, C-A-S-T-R-O. Um, you have to bear with me. These were quick notes in between working and coming to this meeting. Um, I feel that we're, we're a town that comes together when we need to. We came together with the path on Shore Road. We came together on uh, a football field, um, quite a few things. And I think this is the time that we should think about coming together on this issue. There's a lot of people invested in this, the town of Cape Elizabeth, by the taxes of Cross Hill. We want to take care of the people of Cross Hill. They pay quite a bit of taxes. We all do. But I think everybody has a part in this. The people living in Cross Hill, had a, they looked in to buy their house. They want to have a nice house. Um, they needed to look when they bought the house. There's no blame going on here by any means, but I'm just saying that every one of us has a part in this thing. The town did. They okayed the property to be built on Cross Hill without giving any regard to, oh, I can't say with any regard, but try not thinking of things that were coming up in the venture. Uh, the gun club has tried to do a little bit on their part, but eventually things change. We're all going to change. 
Um, I just did some quick statistics. I picked a $150,000. I didn't know about the $80,000. I read that tonight just as I got home about what they're estimating. If you just take the numbers um, and just divide it up and see how much it really is going to cost to try to put a roof or walls on this, $90,000 in a community this size is not very much money. I mean, you may want to fight this. We're probably spending half of that in lawyer fees. Um, we really should think about coming together as a group and saying, this is something that's going to benefit everybody. If they put a roof over it, sides on it, embankments, this is not just going to help the gun club. It's going to help the Cross Hill. It's going to help the town. It's going to increase the taxes for more taxes for the, the town to spend on different things. We're trying to accomplish and make something work for everybody. It's not one group against the other. It's a whole town situation. And I think we should think about coming as a town and helping a situation like anybody else would try to do, help a situation that needs to be taken care of. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing to do. It's not one team or one group against each other. We need to come together. And I don't think the regulation is the answer. I think we need to, if everybody feels that it should be some type of wall, let's come together. You know, there's roughly, I'm going to guess, five to 9,000 people in, in the town of Cape Elizabeth. If everybody just chipped in $100, would take care of the issue. It's not a big deal to think about what we're doing for the community. And what we need to do as a community is come together and think about taking care of this issue instead of fighting against this issue. I really think that if we all pull together, a situation can be taken care of without all the legal stuff that go, has to be going on right now. Thank you again. Thank you. My name is Bobby Manson. I live at One Cardinal Lane. Um, Recent Cape Courier states that the proposed regulations focus primarily on safety issues, and I just don't know what ordinance they're reading because the current ordinance, it just doesn't. In fact, it only says the word safety three times, which is the same as we have in our town sign ordinance, and the language about safety is more strong in the sign ordinance than it is in the shooting range ordinance. My home is one of the homes that was struck by a bullet I have the police report here, and there are others on file. I just don't want my home to be struck by bullets anymore, and I've asked for your help with the issue. Fortunately, so far, it's only been homes, but buses drive right between the houses that have been hit. Kids are playing in the backyard. They're playing football down at the green. It's not acceptable to have bullets coming into the neighborhood, and we've asked for your help to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Eric Mukai. I live on 4 Apple Tree Lane cable, um, in Cross Hill. And uh, one interesting thing that's come to my attention in this hearing that's funny is that we, we, we thought when we would come in here, we would need to fight to stop this ordinance because there are things that we disagreed with that were pointed out by previous speakers. The interesting thing to me is that the Rod and Gun Club doesn't want this ordinance to pass either, um, which was a big surprise to me, um, and that may be my ignorance of different viewpoints. But I think what it points out to me is that maybe this ordinance isn't the right thing for either. And so I'm not sure what the right thing is, but I would ask you to reconsider the ordinance based on the fact that both sides don't seem to really want the ordinance to go through. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucas Homex. I live at 22 Broad Cove Road. Could you please repeat your last name? Homex. Okay. Thank you. Uh, like some others said, I apologize. I came straight from work and I have nothing prepared. Uh, just doing a lot of listening and listening to a lot of arguing. Um, ultimately, a lot of claims going back and forth without a whole lot of facts. Uh, so I thought I'd just say some observations. Observation number one on safety. I've never seen an unsafe act at the gun club when I've been there. Uh, I've also been at the gun club 
and I've never heard the automatic weapons that apparently are firing so fast and so loud. As far as cost is concerned, I think that the Cross Hills Neighborhood Association has a lot more disposable income than does the gun club. Lastly, the council, uh, the town council, you're doing what you're being asked to do, but I ask that you consider the precedence of getting involved with what seems to be a very localized neighborhood dispute. Uh, when you boil down the facts or when you boil out the, all the subjective pieces that are here, it still remains one, by and large, it still remains one neighborhood association against an established club that, again, I've only observed to be very responsible. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Rich Moran, 62 Cross Hill Road. Uh, obviously, the opinion I express will be my own since I won't be allowed back in the neighborhood when I express it. <laughs> I've listened to the arguments on both sides and I've reluctantly come to a conclusion that you should pass this ordinance. It's not perfect. It never will be. I hope ordinances can be amended as necessary as time goes on. But I'm just sorry to hear that uh, the gun club opposes this as well as the neighborhood. The committee itself may not be the answer, but to me it forms a basis for working on a future relationship between the club and the neighborhood. And so I would ask uh, that you uh, pass this ordinance and be open to further changes down the road. One final thing, I'd like to be the first in the neighborhood to contribute $20 to the gun club. Tammy? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Give him a receipt. Give him a receipt. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. My name is Marion Romano. Uh, I only really kind of have a question. Ma'am, excuse me, your address, please. 12 Target Lily Lane. Thank you. There are a lot of kids in our neighborhood. I think there are probably about 100, maybe over 100 children. Um, they don't go out and play a lot. And one mother actually told me she doesn't, sometimes it's hard to get people to let their kids, because of all the publicity, to come to the neighborhood to play. One of the things that I think about, uh, having lived here for so long, is who, when I go to vote, who am I voting for, for town council? Who are you representing? Are you representing the town citizens? Or are you representing the gun club? Are you being asked to choose sides? You know, people sitting in the audience, some of them voted for you. I just don't understand how politics must work when you have to have this kind of a meeting to decide whether or not somebody shoots and could hit a child. Those children, you represent those children. Your job is to protect those children and the town's people. To make sure that we can recreate so we can relax and sit on our porch without having guns go off. I mean, I understand they've been there for a long time. A lot of people were told when they bought homes in the neighborhood when they were building that the gun club was going to dissolve, all these different stories that went around. So, of course, I just really want to look at each one of your faces and just have you look up and look awake and decide whether you want to act for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth who pay taxes or do you want to act for the Rotten Gun Club from what I have been told, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the Rotten Gun Club doesn't pay any taxes on 17 acres. And for them to have the gall to ask us, who pay so much in taxes, to chip in to make their play area better 
when our kids can't go out and play very well. We have to be so careful. So think about it. Think about what you're really doing tonight. What, what is your purpose here? And please, please act in the citizens of Cape Elizabeth's best interest. I know you're trying to be fair, but sometimes you can be too fair and things don't get accomplished and people don't stay protected. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't come here uh, prepared to say anything because I didn't think I was going to say anything. But um, Your name and address, please. Uh, Peter Bowling, 495 Ocean House Road. But uh, I just want to say I, I, I don't belong to the gun club, but I came to support the gun club in that I uh, hate to see the town change. I came here, as a, you know, I lived here when I was a kid, born here. And uh, now I, I returned, bought a house here 13 years ago. And I just hate to see the town change to, I don't know, be perceived as snobby and kick these people out of here. I just don't think that's right. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like golf. If you bought a uh, house near the golf course, you'd get balls in your yard, you know. And, I don't know. I just want to support them and say that uh, I pay taxes here too. I don't belong to the gun club. I just don't think it's right I'm trying to push them out of town. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Klein, 66 Cross Hill Road. I just want to say that it's concerning to me that we still don't know where we stand with regards to safety at the club. We really don't know whether the club meets protocols for shooting ranges specifically set forth by the NRA. Um, and it's also concerning to me that the gun club has been asking publicly for contributions from the neighborhood um, when they haven't been forthcoming with research that they've done about safety and they haven't shared their plans and they haven't even told us who the engineer that they hired was at the last public meeting or they said that they wouldn't share that information. So that's concerning to me. Thank you. I see no one else approaching the, port the podium, so I'm going to declare the public hearing now closed. <clears throat> Before I introduce uh, item 43, which, which is the draft shooting range ordinance. I'd like to ask uh, Councilor Ray, who is, chairman, who is chairman of the ordinance committee, to give us the highlights of this ordinance. Councilor Ray. Thank you. Um, as we all know, we're here tonight to consider the shooting range ordinance, which the town council first looked at last month. It was brought to the town council by the ordinance committee. Um, our attorney, Ken Cole, is here to answer any of the counselors' questions. And a quick thanks again to the town staff, Maureen O'Mara, Neil Williams, and Ben McDougall, and our attorney, Ken Cole, and counselors Sullivan and Walsh, who are on the ordinance committee. I'm going to try to be brief. Um, the ordinance is not brief, and we spent a lot of time on this. Um, first of all, the purpose of the ordinance, I'm going to read this purpose, I won't read the rest of it, but. This shooting range ordinance, this ordinance is intended to regulate the establishment and operation of outdoor shooting range facilities pursuant to 12 MRSA 13201 subsection 1 and 25 MRSA 2011 subsection 3 as they may be amended and 30-A MRSA 301 at sequence Maine's Home Rule Law. Due to their potential noise impacts and safety concerns, shooting range facilities merit careful review to minimize adverse effects on adjoining properties. This ordinance does not otherwise apply to the general discharge of firearms or the use of bows and arrows in accordance with all other applicable laws or regulations. It goes on to um, state the intent for permitting registration and compliance. It 
talks about applicability, performance standards, shot containment, noise mitigation, minimum design requirements, setbacks, warning signs, distance from occupied dwellings, access to shooting rain facilities secured and controlled, maintenance, best management practices, hours of operations, liability insurance, procedure for securing approval for new ranges, which includes license application, fees, required information, site plan, action, registration and compliance of existing shooting range facilities, registration, compliance, abandonment and discontinuance, firing range committee, um, and I will just indicate that the firing range committee um, this ordinance would establish would include five members. One member of the Spur Rink Rod and Gun Club who is a member of the National Rifle Association to be designated by the Spur Rink Rod and Gun Club. One member of the public at large to be appointed by the town council. One member of the public at large who is a certified firearms instructor to be appointed by the town council and two members of the town council to be appointed by the town council, one of whom will serve as the chair of the firing range committee. Um, the police chief and the code enforcement officer shall serve as ex officio members of the firing range committee. Um, talks about complaints, rules and regulations, background checks, municipal hearing and licensing, license transferability, changes or expansions, exceptions and additional findings and conditions, enforcement remedies and penalties, and civil penalties. So that is sort of an overview. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen this. This is on the website, um, should you wish to read um, all the pieces. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Ray. So we now have item 43, draft shooting range ordinance. Um, is there a motion to consider the draft, Councilor Ray? I'm going to read all of this, if you don't mind. Yes, what, yes please read the ordinance um, uh, resolution. Thank you. Uh, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, March 10th, 2014, hereby makes the following findings and adopts a new Chapter 24 of the revised official code of ordinances of the Town of Cape Elizabeth, said ordinance being the January 24, 2014 draft recommended by the Ordinance Committee and entitled Shooting Range Ordinance, a copy of which is to be attached to the minutes of this meeting and which shall be filed with the main commissioner of the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Number one, the 1941 Cape Elizabeth bylaws regarding disturbing the peace readopted in 1951 as amended March 14, 1955, regulated noise while concurrently authorizing shooting ranges approved by the municipal officers. The implication is that the sounds generated at a shooting range were considered in compliance with existing noise regulations. Number two, the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club was established in the town of Cape Elizabeth in 1904, 1954, or 1955 and was thereafter authorized by the municipal officers. Number three, chapter nine of the current Cape Elizabeth Code of Ordinances at section 9-1-1 allows the discharge of firearms at the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Number four, state law preempts pre municipalities from adopting noise ordinances that limit or prohibit shooting activities that have occurred on a regular basis at a shooting range prior to enactment. C 30-A MRSA 3003011 Number 5 state law does not preempt the regulation of new shooting ranges or expansion of uses at existing shooting ranges. Number 6 expansion of uses at existing shooting ranges may include but is not limited to physical expansion, increased hours of operation, expansion in the type of shooting and expansion in the type of firearms discharged. Number seven, the town is not obligated to license shooting ranges, but
but may elect to do so to protect public safety. Number eight, public safety mandates that any shooting range must operate with 100% shot containment. Number nine, bullets have been found in homes in the neighborhood abutting the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Number 10, the draft shooting range ordinance includes standards from the NRA source book regarding both noise and public safety. Number 11, it is the town council's intent to work with the existing shooting range to meet its licensing requirements in a manner that prioritizes public safety and secondarily moderates the financial impact on the club. Number 12, phasing does not eliminate the requirement to meet standards and can be used by the applicant to create a multi-step improvement program subject to approval by the town council. Number 13, exceptions are provided for in the ordinance to provide flexibility while still meeting public safety requirements. Number 14, it is the town council's intent that a professional range safety evaluation be conducted as part of the license application. Number 15, annual licensing will ensure continuing municipal oversight of both public safety and noise mitigation at shooting ranges. Thank you. Thank you, Council Ray. Is there a second? Seconded. Council Walsh. Discussion. Council McCausland. Uh, do we have the attorney here to answer some questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cole is here. Uh, Mr. Cole, would you step to the podium to answer questions from uh, counselors? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is, and I heard a lot of comments tonight about safety primarily. I also heard about noise. Um, I heard about club rights, uh, taxpayers' rights. And I think what we're being asked to vote on here is an ordinance that is, as I understand it, both something new but also something that the town has no obligation to put in place. Is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> There's no requirement that shooting ranges be licensed by main law. So I'm trying to, to understand the town's interest in the issue and the town's responsibility in the issue. Starting at the beginning again, the town has no obligation to license shooting ranges. It's obviously its interest and its responsibility going forward is one that it's accepting on behalf of its citizens that it is not required to accept. Um, and I would reiterate, as I've said at prior meetings, because it's a licensing process, uh, the town is actually uh, immune from tort liability uh, because main law creates that immunity in order that the town will in fact engage in this process. Um, otherwise, we get, if, if there were liability, no municipality would in fact stick its neck out far enough to decide it wanted to go through a licensing process. Now, when Councillor Ray just read through some of the verbiage here, she mentioned the town is not obligated to license shooting ranges but may elect to do so to protect public safety and also that public safety mandates that any shooting range must operate with 100% shot containment. So is your sense that the ordinance as it's proposed addresses that issue? The ordinance, as proposed, allows the council to address that issue through both the range committee initially and then the council through licensing. Um, there is, through that licensing process, a determination can be made in regard to safety. One of the requirements that people have requested uh, has been a range evaluation, a safety range evaluation. And one of the findings that was uh, read by Councilor Ray related to the council um, actually seeking such an evaluation prior to licensing. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Sherman. Mm -hmm. uh, on that last topic, and this may be less of a question for the town attorney and more of a question for the rest of the council, I mean, it seems to me if we state in uh, this motion that our intent is that a professional range safety evaluation be conducted as part of the licensing process, we ought to, rather than just say it's our intent, we ought, to, we ought to just say it's required as part of the licensing process. Is that something that 
uh, well, I'll ask our town attorney first. Could we make that a requirement as a part of the licensing process? It, it, could, it could absolutely be added to the ordinance. Uh, in fact, I believe the ordinance committee uh, discussed this. and It was decided that um, it might be better not to so that the actual range committee itself would have the authority initially to go through that type of safety evaluation before it came to the council. Uh, that would allow the council a more focused uh, approach to the safety issue. Certainly, it could be put in, but it was felt that it was a, a reasonable requirement that both the, the committee and the council could require on their own. I mean, it, again, just, it, and I'll throw it out there to the rest of the council, it seems to me we ought to just simply require it. And uh, when, if we're getting closer to voting on this, I would move that we amend the proposed ordinance to make it a requirement and not just our intent. And I'm frankly trying to find where in this draft ordinance the safety range evaluation is mentioned. And I, honestly, I looked and looked earlier today and I was unable to find it in the in proposed chapter, proposed chapter 24. Is it part of the... Where you would probably want it, depending on your choice, would be either to put it in the application process as it is with the firing range committee, or later into the municipal hearing process where it relates to the municipal officer's review. Um, I can obviously sit down once I'm done talking and okay. scribble something in the appropriate location. All right. Did you want to address that? I had another question unrelated, but if Councilor Jordan has something related to it, I'd defer to her. Councilor Jordan. Um, yes, I was, some of my notes as well, is trying to figure out if our intent was to have a professional safety range done, looking at the requirements for a license, you know, you know, you have to have the property lines, you have to have the layout, the noise contours, the show the structures within half a mile and have the insurance. That information then goes to the firing range committee, right. who then has 30 days to act. And from my understanding, there's no fee for a license except for the engineering and professional services that might be used to review the application. I'm not seeing, as Councillor Sherman said, where it's laid out what exactly is going to happen from then. I mean, the five people on the five people on the firing committee, what are they looking at to determine whether or not to approve or disapprove uh, a license? If everybody has the property lines, the layout, and what is there to study and make a decision on? Sure. Two things. One, there couldn't be a license fee because there's a state law that prohibits that, just so everybody understands that. Um, secondarily, in regard to what they're studying, it basically, if you go back to 24-8-1, uh, talks about the license application itself, and then 24-8-3 talks about the required information accompanying it. it. But beyond that, it was actually, which was basically to, to lay out the physical uh, site and what was occurring on it. Beyond that, the intent really was, and this goes back to what I said earlier, to allow the firing range committee to interact with the applicant and find, determine what actually was going on in there and what was safety and to give them that flexibility to require that type of professional safety evaluation that you were talking about and that is in Councillor Ray's uh, findings. I was just saying, it just seems like we're, we're leaving quite a bit left out in the open to be determined down the line by the firing committee that's then going to come back to the town or the town council to approve what regulations they seem to want to approve. I just didn't know why we weren't more focused on appointing if we want a professional range safety or something else, why we're not just saying that right now. It's within the council's discretion to do it. Uh, again, the purpose was to sort of build a process since there hadn't been one and to build that process through the firing range committee. Councilor Sherman, do you want to put your thought in the form of a motion to amend? Uh, I, I would move that, uh, that we amend the motion that's on the table to include as a requirement uh, for the license application a professional range safety evaluation. Would you, could you speak to where that would be in the? Can I suggest 24-8-1? Uh, 
I'm sorry, what? 24-8-1, which is the upper half of page 6. It says the firing range committee, the submission to the firing range committee, which application shall contain detailed contact information regarding the applicant, uh, and then you could add include and shall further include right at that point. And shall further include, so I would move that we amend section 24-8-1, uh, which is captioned license application, uh, to include at the end of the first sentence and which shall also include a professional range safety evaluation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, or does it have to go back to the original? Well, I think we have to, I think we have to move and discuss the amendment before we can go back to the original motion. Am I correct? Yeah, any member of the council may second it, and that's on the floor. You do not need approval of the initial you don't. mover. Right. So, so I would second. Okay. I would second. So now we would have discussion on the amendment, on Councilor Sherman's amendment. Well, I mean, if you if if you if, you, if, you, read, yeah. if you read, you know, any of the emails we've received, and we have received many, and 17 folks tonight mentioned the word safety, and again, Mrs. Klein again continues to remind us that this is not stated, and you both went to look for it, it wasn't there, even though we stated our intent. I mean, it seems to me a very clear um, statement, and including it in the ordinance, let there be no question, it is part of the application process. And we, the only other point I would make is that when we talked about this, this committee, um, is it it's Scarborough, is it not, that has a similar process? Correct. And uh, what we are trying to do is develop a, a procedure where this group would dig into the detail and then make a recommendation of the license back to this council. And then obviously we would do whatever we need to do with that license application, either approve or disapprove, based upon whatever findings we might have. But the process was really one to kind of push it to a little bit of an arm's length and have them do the heavy lifting as it pertains to making sure that we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. So I'm, I am absolutely 100% behind putting safety evaluation in the ordinance with no questions asked. Councilor Chairman? I mean, chances are the application for a gun club license will likely happen once in the history of Cape Elizabeth. I have not foreseen that we're going to have a lot of gun clubs applying for licenses, and that has been the focus of many of the common that it needs to have this evaluation. My understanding is the gun club has already paid for and had one conducted anyway, so I don't see that that would impose an undue hardship because they already have one. So I, I'm, I very much support the amendment that I made, obviously, uh, and hope the council will adopt it. Thank you. Is there any other comment? So would you just repeat your amendment again, and then I'll call for the vote. Uh, this is, okay, sure. I, uh, section, and, and please just highlight the section. Sure. I move that we amend proposed section 24-8-1 captioned license application to include the following phrase at the end of the first sentence, which shall also contain a professional range safety evaluation. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment? It's unanimous. So the amendment passes to the original motion. So now we return to discussion of the original motion. Is there any more discussion on that? Councilor Jordan. Um, going off of Councilor Sherman's comment about we'll probably only have one license come before us, I wanted to look at the fact that it needs to be renewed every year or basically have to reapply every year. I don't know if I missed the part where you can just renew but do you have to go through this process every year? Do you have to have a professional range evaluation done every year? Are we going to set a public hearing every year for the license to be issued? Or is there a no changes have been made renewal process that we can implement? A little of both. Um, there would be an annual renewal and an annual public hearing. The, the intention totally there to have that in order to basically continue the public input in case the license, for whatever reason, wasn't properly followed. Uh, 
however, again, going back to this range committee, our whole thought was they would come up with a process that would address renewals during the next year post the first license, which would come back to this body to adopt, and then there would be a, a process for renewal. We didn't try to build it into this because, again, we were trying to come up with the flexibility of allowing the, the actual committee that was working on the ground to come up with the renewal process. But we did build in the requirement of an annual license which would have an annual public hearing. So then, okay. Go ahead. So then now we've added that there'll be an annual professional range safety evaluation. But I would suspect that before, uh, may not happen, but, but it's for this council to, uh, to sort of uh, prod it along if necessary, before you get to a renewal, that range committee will have met sufficiently and come up with sufficient regulations and brought them back to you to sort of flesh this out some to address that sort of question such as renewal. And, and again, that was the intention. Uh, as Councillor Walsh said, we look to what Scarborough has done where they have much more, I mean, you think this is detailed, they have much more because they actually have a whole series of regulations that came from the committee uh, and that was the basis going forward that explained it in much more detail. This ordinance basically sets up a similar structure and that range committee would hopefully come up with analogous regulations before the first renewal date. Council Walsh. Uh, can I just ask, Kaylin, do you, do you think it's, it's too onerous to, to do that? I mean, I mean, I mean do you think, feel as though we're putting undue sort of requirements well, in place? Well, I'm just going based on the comment that since they already did one, they're not going to have to do another one. Sure. I, I don't know how much did a range, a professional range safety evaluation yeah. cost. Is it too onerous? You know, how, how much changes year to year in a, yeah. in a, in an, inside the firing range? Is it too much to ask year to year? And my concern is we, we put it in place, and then what if no changes come? Now we've put this into place, and it's going to be in place. I just I think back to, I hate to bring up short-term rentals, but we put that into place, and we were supposed to review it, and that was a one neighborhood kind of issue. And we're going to be going on you know 18 months before we review short-term rental, so I just don't want to put something into place that's going to, hmm. you know, we're, going to, we're saying basically that we're going to make more rules and regulations down the road. I just If I can point to um, page 11, it's just to show you, you do have some flexibility. I hate to raise it because it seems to be a, an area that other people are concerned with, but it, it's quite clear in that process, and we built it in, that the municipal officers have the authority to accept and I'll ditto along here, exceptions from the terms of this ordinance with a couple of edits in what I'm saying. So if for whatever reason the Rain Safety Committee doesn't act and you don't have regulations, <clears throat> then it is a year later and the club has been licensed and comes back in and it costs whatever it costs, say $2,000, you can accept that application with an exception basically, saying based on their uh, representation to you that nothing has occurred differently. Um, but the annual licensing intent was simply to basically keep um, public awareness and consciousness of both the range and the abutters alert so that if there were problems they would come up before this council. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Sherman. Uh, yeah, Mr. Cole. Uh, we continue to get uh, a fair amount of email traffic on the 1941 Disturbing the Peace Ordinance. And I think the argument is, and I may be wrong, uh, that although uh, the selectmen authorized the gun club in 1955 or 1961, that doesn't mean that the Disturbing the Peace Ordinance no longer applied. They, the, the council didn't necessarily got the Disturbing the Peace Ordinance, and although the existing firearms ordinance was enacted to allow the uh, firing of uh, weapons at the Spurwing Rod and Gun Club, uh, and that was, I think, 1964, and then maybe amended in 1991, that still didn't impact the application of the Disturbing the Peace Ordinance. So can you respond to that argument? 
Well, we tried to put that into number one of the findings. If you go back to the original Disturbing the Peace Ordinance, as it was in 41, 51, and mid-50s, before it was as it is today, it actually contained an additional provision, I believe it was Article uh, 14, of that actual ordinance, which basically said, here's all these things that are a violation of disturbing the peace, but at Article 14 it said <clears throat> that shooting ranges authorized by the municipal officers were permissive. Now, you, you cannot in the same ordinance uh, in essence create an exception for shooting ranges uh, in 1941. Uh, relating to a range that was approved somewhere in 54 or 55 originally by the municipal officers, and now, 60 years later, argue that the existing disturbing, disturbing to peace ordinance is applicable to it. The original one might have been, but there was an exception, and the municipal officers, in fact, did approve it. So you can't go back to that and claim that that's the basis for enforcement. And you can't come to the current one but because of the statute that we referenced in the uh, first paragraph that was read by Councillor Ray in regard to shooting ranges, where the state of Maine has said that you cannot create a noise ordinance, basically, that will impact existing uses at an existing shooting range. Uh, so, it's unless there was an ordinance in place already. So if you go back, that's why we continue to hear about the 1941 ordinance. Did it already exist, and therefore was there already regulation? Yes, it already existed, but it already had an exception in it if the municipal officers approved of the shooting range. One was properly, I wouldn't use the word licensed because it isn't really a license, but one was properly authorized by the municipal officers. And so we can't now use that same ordinance 60 years after the fact and try to close down this range. Councilor Sherman. The other issue that has come up is the, the issue of defining the baseline. Uh, and uh, as an aside, I think there are different reasons in this room tonight why people don't want this ordinance enacted. And if I thought everybody didn't want the ordinance enacted for the same reason, I might be inclined to vote against it. But I, I think one group is saying you're going way too far, and the other group is saying you're not going nearly far enough. And as often happens, for better or for worse, up here on the town council, is we often find a, a middle ground that satisfies no one. But getting back to the baseline, uh, you know, I, I think it's probably, as uh, Mr. Wagner pointed out in our meeting last month, through discovery, we could potentially figure out what the baseline of uses was five years ago. That, to me, seems like a very difficult task, but just assume for the sake of argument that we could. I, I that think that I'd only say one thing. That also presumes that you really are spending those tens of thousands of dollars on lawyers, because that's the only way you're going to have this covered. <laughs> All right? right. Just, just, it, no, understood. But okay. let's just say, for example, the gun club came in and uh, said, here's all the information on what's happened over the last 20 years. And so five years ago, they had 300 members. They had a log of the types of firearms that were discharged on the premises, the frequency, et cetera. So you had a, a pretty definitive view of what the baseline was five years ago. Um, is it possible today to enact? And, and we determined that today it's great, say, in a, a degree of 10%. Is it possible today to enact a baseline five years ago? or legal, I guess is what I'm saying. It, would it I would, be that as a, a legal? My answer would be, would be no, again, based on that statute, which said that you cannot create a noise ordinance that impacts uh, what was existing uh, use at a, at a shooting range. The problem with that is even if you could establish that baseline, it's going to be, in one way or another, an average or a mean or a median. It, it, can, it can't be an empirical standard such, such as we put in here is that going forward at all times there will be a certain uh, decibel level at the property line. Uh, and so even if you did it, trying to enforce it, uh, I believe a, a court would find problematic at best because it would be very difficult to actually prove empirically that that was really what it was. It's always going to be based, as we've heard from time again, on all the meetings that both the the ordinance committee had that the council has had on different public doctrine in regard to what they heard, different public testimony. You can go through all that discovery, and my suspicion is you're going to end up with 
that wide variety of testimony. And if you simply pick an average or a mean, I don't think a court's going to buy that that's a baseline. Thank you. Councilor Jordan? Um, question about you were saying that you can't enact an ordinance for noise. So in this proposed ordinance, it talks about setting a limit of 65 DPA. And then inside the application, you have to have projected noise contours sufficient to demonstrate compliance as determined by an engineer. Can you explain how that is not creating a noise ordinance? That relates both in the ordinance, both to any proposed new shooting range and any proposed expansion of this shooting range. So in order to make a judgment, both as to the existing one and any proposed additional one, you need to have a sound engineer uh, make those determinations. Otherwise, the baseline that Councilor Sherman is talking about that we can establish now as a part of this ordinance wouldn't be established either. Uh, the intent by this ordinance is to actually establish that baseline so that going forward, one will be able to judge whether changes are violating a noise term, basically, if it comes down. So if it was determined that the current Rod and Gun Club is setting off 70 DPA or, you know, DPA, D, <laughs> DPA, then that would not Matter. They would not be in violation if they were in terms of their current use. That is correct. Absolutely. Okay. Council Walsh, did you have a question? No, just, uh, I just want to reiterate what both, uh, you know, Council Sherman and uh, Council Jordan have stated. I mean, I think that what took place while this, this ordinance has, was being developed is there was sort of an unintentional con consequence that happened here where there was a new present state essentially being somehow outlined in the application process that was today. And a lot of the debate and discussion that we had and a lot of the input receiving at different levels in our, in our analysis was, you know, it's gotten louder. It's gotten louder. There were semi-automatic weapons, weapons going off. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, um, like you said, uh, David, is that, you know, half the room agrees, half doesn't. I mean, it's sort of a, it's kind of a, a difficult position because we're in new territory here. This is the first council that has ever uh, attempted to go and do something, and we are just doing that. And uh, it's unfortunate, but by doing so, we are going to establish a present state. And, you know, that in and of itself is um, good on one side, and maybe not so good on another, but the reality is it's part of the application and license process. And like I said, an unintentional consequence is a result of asking in a lot of ways for this council to act. We've been called a lot of things in the last couple of years by a lot of people. We've been called disingenuous, we've been called cowards, we've been called just about every name in the book in terms of not doing the things that should be done for the safety and welfare of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And tonight we heard from one citizen who basically questioned us as to what we do up here and why we're up here and what the, the core of what we're doing as town councilors. Um, I don't think anybody up here enjoys the fact that we've been um, somewhat vilified. We decided to run for election. We decided to run for town council. And I believe very strongly that this is the first council that has stepped up and is, a, is about to do something. And I, I feel very strongly that, uh, you know, I guess the one measure you use in, 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 in politics is if no one's happy, then you probably did the right thing. Uh, and that's basically what's happened here, is it, no one's really happy with this. But I really believe if people can move, um, I heard some other words that were kind of interesting here, compromise and trust, some harmony and wins. There's been no trust on either side. It's been observed by us for the last couple of years. We're stepping in to try to bring this to a better place. And I really believe that once people here can trust us, trust this entity, I think you're going to find that we're going to have a much safer and a much more harmonious community, one that I know Cape Elizabeth is all about. But it's been difficult today to read what people have said. Uh, it's just unbelievable. 
People are passionate, yeah. They care, but so do we. And I really believe we've tried to do the right thing. And if we don't, we will certainly go back and revisit it. And I just want to point out to uh, Caitlin Jordan that one of the reasons the short-term rental hasn't been evaluated is that the decision was made by the code enforcement officer to run into a new season, which is the upcoming season, because there were a lot of misses last year in terms of people who were applying for short-term rental licensing. So he decided to, to go one more season and at that time determine you know, what worked, what didn't work, and what we need to adjust. So I really believe in the long, long haul, I think we're on the right track. I just want the citizens of the community to understand that I believe we've done our homework and I really believe that uh, once this thing is uh, settled and, and whatever the decision of the council is tonight, I think that uh, you're going to find that we'll, we're going to be going a long way to creating a much safer community for everybody. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Cole? Any other council questions for Mr. Cole? Council Sherman. Uh, this is a more specific uh, question or observation. The firing range committee outlined in section 24-10-1 describes the makeup of that group. Uh, one who's a member of the Rod and Gun Club, uh, one is a member of the public at large, one is a certified firearms instructor, and then the two others are members of the council. I think it's likely, but not de definite, that the third person, the certified firearms instructor, may be a member of the Rod and Gun Club. So that's, that has a potential for, for two out of the five to be members of the Rod and Gun Club. So the council members, we don't necessarily control whether they're members or not, uh, but that, that member of the public at large should be appointed by the council. It would seem to me it would be important that that person not be a member of the Rod and Gun Club. I assume the intent there was that it be presumably a member of the Crossville neighborhood. Now you can't say it has to be from somebody from that neighborhood, but it seems to me it should be somebody not from the Gun Club. Again, because of the mere fact that this council appoints the individuals who will be the three other than the two, uh, one really designated by the Rod and Gun Club, but the other two totally open and the two counselors totally amongst yourselves, we left that open. That's for your appointments committee. Uh, we weren't trying to prejudge uh, your eventual appointment by what we put in here, but clearly we discussed, and I'm sure Councilor Ray would agree, that the one citizen would not probably be a member uh, of the Spur of Rod and Gun Club. Councilor Ray, would you like to speak to that? Yes, um, <clears throat> just um, to reiterate what uh, Mr. Cole said. When we talked about the um, member of the public at large who is a certified firearms instructor, that person is appointed by the town council. So it's the town council's decision as to who that person would be. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be somebody who is a member of the Rod and Gun Club. Um, when we spoke with um, um, Chief Williams, he indicated that he would know people who might fit that description, but they also may not be members of the Rod and Gun Club. So it's up to the council as to how that makeup goes together. And I just, we had a lot of discussion about that, so I didn't want you to think that we didn't think that, try to think that through to try to have a balance, because we were very um, focused on trying to have a balance in this firing range committee. Um, so that there wasn't the perception or that, that we were favoring one group over another. It wasn't, a, um, it wasn't one of those types of things. And uh, maybe Jim wants to. No, add so to that. just in addition, I think that we also determined that that person could very well live outside of Cape Elizabeth. Right. We struck yes. a provision that had been in there that was yeah. going to require was a that everybody be a Cape requirement. Elizabeth resident. Yeah. And we um, pulled that out. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I, when I see public, excuse me, public at large, yeah. I think it's the public of Cape Elizabeth or yeah. Cape Elizabeth residents. So if, if it can go beyond our, the borders of our town, then that would uh, mm. enlarge the group of potential applicants. Yeah. 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 Yes, thank you. And we did, no, we did that because we were not sure that there would be members of the Cape Elizabeth public that would fit that, um, that description. In order to, Council Jordan, one more question. Yes, and I apologize. I was not here at the last meeting and I tried to catch up as much as I could, but one more question about the 100% shock containment and the shock containment provision. Is that 
mean that like enclosed firing range structures or the requirement of this no blue sky or can you achieve shot containment with an open range? <clears throat> to be again honest, we were not trying to prejudge that. Okay. Uh, then that's why this was structured again as to the existing range to give the council some flexibility. Because if they were moving toward no blue sky and your firing range committee came back and said that's what it's got to be, uh, then we wanted you to have the flexibility to potentially work with them to reach that no blue sky, uh, which you've heard this evening they're moving toward, but they may not be able to have in place as a part of the initial licensing. In order to move, move the item along, are there any further questions for Mr. Cole? I'd like to end that section of our discussion. Any, anything else for Mr. Cole? Thank you, Mr. Cole. Thank you. Um, we've heard uh, Councilor Walsh's thoughts. Would any councilor <coughs> like to make a final statement before we move the question? Councilor <coughs> Ray. I decided to write down some of my thoughts um, so I wouldn't forget. Um, but um, I felt that when I was, as, as the chair of ordinance, I got a chance to really work and see this um, fully. Um, and I felt it was important to strike a balance for safety for all citizens in their homes with limited regulation. Um, safety is key. And um, I know of no reported accidents or injuries that I'm aware of. And um, to restate what Councillor Walsh said, if everybody here is a little unhappy and a little happy, then we've done our job. Um, just to back up a minute, the town council was approached by both parties twice. And both times we sent them back to work it out between themselves. They were either unable or unwilling to do so. We then hired attorney Cole, and the town council did hire him. And to try to mediate an agreement between the two parties, and he was unable to get them to agree on a compromise. Um, I am concerned about the misinformation that's been flying around. Uh, one references the sound ordinances, and why aren't we enforcing sound ordinances? When you look at the fact that they actually exempt firing ranges, um, I think sometimes people read what they want to read, and then they take off on a piece, and they don't read the rest of it. Um, I think people have become very emotional. And I can understand. Um, we've received many comments, public comments, with opinions that range all over the place. And I think you heard some of them tonight. Uh, it puts us in a tough position. But I think as the town council, we are doing the only thing that we can do. We can do nothing. And I don't think anybody would be happy with that. Um, or we can enact an ordinance. And I think we've worked hard to do that. Um, we reviewed all the comments that we received. The Ordinance Committee met three times. And at one particular meeting, I was re running the meeting, four people in the room were going through, and we were going through every single comment, every question, including Attorney Cole, to try to make sure that we looked at and addressed everything that we could that was within our power. Um, I believe in civil discourse with the emphasis on civil. Many of the public comments we have received are what I consider less than civil. Personal attacks on ourselves, our attorney, and others. I didn't grow up in a town that does that, because I did grow up in Cape Elizabeth. And that's not the way we acted to our neighbors before. If we had a problem, we worked it out. I'm not taking one side or the other. I'm not. My intent is always to represent all citizens in the town and try to broker a compromise whether they voted for me or not. And I will look you in the eye when I say that. Thank you, Council Ray. Council Council? No? Anyone else? Council Sherman. Yeah, I, I think the key issue has been cited numerous times tonight and in the email correspondence and at various other times for public comment, and that is safety. Uh, uh, somebody whom I know said tonight uh, that there is, uh, it's not acceptable to have bullets come into the neighborhood. That's, you know, I hate to be flip, but that's stating the obvious. I think everybody can agree with that. And for me, uh, enacting this ordinance to deal with the issue of safety is critical. And so I, I can't tonight vote to do nothing. 
Uh, I, I, you know, a lot of times you, you get that sentiment expressed to you when people don't like the ordinance that you're considering, but I think the, the, the alternative to do nothing is just not acceptable for residents of Cross Hill and Cape Elizabeth generally, as well as the gun club. Um, I uh, appreciate the fact that we've gotten so much public input. I appreciate the folks from the gun club showing up here. Uh, I don't particularly like guns. I don't shoot guns. I don't own a gun. Uh, I've never set foot in the gun club, but I respect the fact that they have a right to be there. Uh, I have to respect the laws enacted by the state of Maine and our constitution. Uh, so I think this is a reasonable first step. We have to start somewhere. Uh, and we, we need to establish a baseline. If we don't do anything, we're going to face a, potentially the same problem five or ten years from now. And I, I just don't think that this council should kick the can down the road, do nothing, and let somebody else deal with it. So I'm prepared to vote in favor of tonight's ordinance. Anyone else? I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, I think that the town council has acted responsibly and respectfully uh, to all parties. I think we have produced something that is balanced and fair. Uh, Maine is a hunting and fishing state. It's a rural state. And Second Amendment rights are protected by state statutes and federal laws. And we have worked very hard to be mindful of those. But also to understand that, that there are neighbors that are worried. And so I think we've addressed that. I think this is an excellent beginning. And I commend the Ordinance Committee and the rest of the counselors for all the hard work they've done. I commend all our citizens for reaching out to us to express their concerns. And we've, we've heard the entire gamut. <laughs> but that's our job. So I thank you all. And now, all those in favor. Before you go uh, into that, do you have to get the original motion to accept the amendment? No, no, and the, the motion, the original motion has been amended, amended and it has been, it was already uh, motioned and seconded. So we, I believe we are ready to vote. So all those in favor. It passes unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> Council Wagner. <laughs> nice to have you back. <laughs> yeah. 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 To press it. Uh, yeah, I was surprised. I was surprised. I didn't. Okay. Thank you. Uh, wait. Excuse me. It was. We got some work. Excuse me, Caitlin. <laughs> Jordan. Did you go out? We made some money. Made some hours. Pizza. Yeah, I like that. Yes, Item number 44. Luckily, we had a longer night. So Item number 44. Right. Arboretum at Fort Williams Park. Approvals. Excuse me, there's still a meeting going on. If you take Thank the conversations you. out, please. Yep. We have a, a long meeting to get through, so we appreciate your cooperation. Okay. Item number 44, Arboretum at Fort Williams Park approvals. Um, I would like to ask uh, Councillor Walsh, who is the Fort Williams liaison, would you address this, please? Okay, we um, make the uh, motion, or do you, I mean, we just had, just, had a workshop. Just a brief, just a, just just a brief, brief workshop. Brief we had a, uh, Thank you. We had a workshop the other day uh, where we um, had the, uh, the Arboretum uh, Lighthouse View and Children's Garden presented to us by the uh, by the committee, and um, I think we had a chance to understand what the plan was, and uh, I, we asked good questions, and uh, I think most of us were pretty impressed with the work that they had done up to now, and look to uh, them being able to uh, move forward. Uh, the Lighthouse View is, of course, um, uh, as our as our role of being um, on the board of the uh, Portland Head Light. Uh, that is, a, um, is an effort that we participated in, in a matching uh, donation. So um, I, I would like to move that the town, Cape Elizabeth Town Council received a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and having reviewed the plans at a workshop held on February 24th, 2014, hereby approves the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation's plan for the two sites at Fort Williams Park for Lighthouse View and the proposed Children's Garden. 
Is there a second? Second. Co Councilor Jordan? I'm sorry. She spoke, right. but I didn't see her. <laughs> oh, Councilor Jordan, is there any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 45, Port Williams Park Group Use Request. I'll ask uh, the town manager to address this, please. Yeah, there's some uh, an exciting uh, event happening in Cape Elizabeth uh, this year. St. Albans Episcopal Church is having their 100th anniversary. And uh, if you look at the, the history of the church from the letter that we, we received from the pastor, uh, they actually had their, their very first event on June 22nd, 1914, in a tent at Fort Williams Park. Hmm. And they're looking to reprise that, which I think is just fascinating. And the Fort Williams Advisory Commission looked at this request, recommended to approve it. Uh, to allow uh, St. Albans to have a worship service at the park on Sunday, June 22nd, 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a, mm. a uh, motion? Uh, Councilor Coslin? I move to accept that Fort, uh, Fort Williams Park group use request. Thank you. Councilor Wagner? Second. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in oh, favor? I just wanted to say congratulations to them on celebrating their first hundred years in Cape Elizabeth. It's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 46, storage space lease at building number 326 in Fort Williams Park. I'll ask uh, the town manager again to address this. Uh, yes, this is a very small space in building, building 326 Fort Williams Park, which is the larger of the two offices, row buildings. Behavioral health resources already leases quite a bit of space there. This would be taking on a little more space uh, that we had not leased. Uh, it looks like it's a good return for the town, uh, and it also helps one of uh, our uh, tenants. Thank you. Who's a Cape Elizabeth resident. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Councilor Ray. I move that we accept um, the approval of the lease of the storage space in Building 326 at Fort Williams Park to Behavioral Health Services Resources, Inc. for a three-year term beginning March 1st, 2014. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Sherman. Any more discussion? No? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous. <laughs> Item number 47, proposed amendment to the ordinances regarding smoking at Fort Williams Park. Um, I would ask the uh, ordinance chairman, Councilor Ray, to tell us about this. Yes, the ordinance committee um, met um, and we, I have my other list here. Um, we met and we met with um, William Brownell, the um, Fort Williams Advisory Committee chair um, on February 7th meeting. And we heard that from them that they uh, supported um, having a smoking um, ordinance at Fort Williams. We also heard from um, Opportunity Alliance, and they indicated that they would be helpful with us for signage and so forth and anything that we might do, because they have been involved with this in some other um, towns. So um, what we have before us here tonight is the first blush of the smoking um, prohibition which would be added to our miscellaneous offenses ordinance. Um, it's fairly short and it's in um, your packet. So I don't know if there's any questions, but um, I guess um, we would answer questions and then ask for this to go for a public hearing on April 14th. I don't know if I need to make a motion to that. Make a motion. Okay. Yes, um, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby sets a public hearing from Monday, April 14th, 2014, at 7 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall on the proposed amendment to Chapter 12 of the revised official code of ordinances of the Town of Cape Elizabeth, which would have the effect of banning smoking within Fort Williams Park. Zero second. Councilor Sherman? Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of setting this uh, proposed amendment to a public hearing? All those in favor? Sorry. Oh, it's unanimous. Okay. Item number 48, school boiler project. I'd like to uh, ask again the town manager to, to tell us about this. Yeah, th this is an issue that town council has heard a little bit about uh, from the school department, uh, particularly from their finance committee, uh, regarding their desire to replace some boilers at the schools. It will be coming back for some uh, 
authorization of the school department to borrow the money, uh, but this gets going on the, the permitting procedure uh, for work that uh, they would like to do uh, coming up. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion? Council Walsh? Yeah, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby authorize the town manager to apply to the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board and to the Marine, um, Maine Department of Environmental Protection for permits needed to update the boiler serving the Pond Cove School and the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland? Any discussion? Question? Yes. I haven't made it through, but is this um, in currently in the uh, budget books that we have? The price of this? Uh, through, through the chairman, uh, th this was part of the proposal that uh, Michael Moore made right. uh, to the town council. I don't believe the cost of it will be hitting, uh, you know, this coming year's budget. It'd be, it'd be the, the year after. Okay, thank you. So that would be in year, fiscal year 16. 16. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Mm -hmm. Item 49, uh, proposed executive session, draft motion. Mm -hmm. oh. Appointments. Appointments. Sorry. Oh, gosh. Oh. You know what? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Can I? I've got the old one, I guess. Draft. Yeah, I've got the old draft. Okay. Item number 49, appoint appointments. I'm going to turn this over to the appointments chairman, Council Jordan. Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased to announce that we were able to fill all seven spots of the Senior Citizen Advisory Commission. I know we had had discussions when forming that commission, putting languages up to seven. So i um, pleased to announce the seven um, participants will be Elizabeth Bailey, Patricia Brendenberg, William Marshall, Bruce Nelson, June O'Neill, Barbara Page, and Brett Sikas, Seekins. Uh, as well, we also had a spot on the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, and that will be Gil Brennan. Uh, motion for the Town Council to accept the recommendations of the Appointments Committee. And a second. Councilor McCausland? Any discussion? Councilor Sherman? Uh, it's the first time I've actually served on the Appointments Committee, now my sixth year on the Council, and I was just impressed not only with the, the process that had been developed long before my arrival, but also the quality of the applicants. Uh, it was not an easy decision, and I think all of us felt that uh, we had, everybody would have been a terrific addition, and we were just trying to find the right mix of the committee to, to sort of represent different interests in town. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I just want to express my appreciation to not only the people who have been appointed to the, these two commissions or boards, but also the people who applied and, and weren't appointed, and I hope they'll reapply at some future date. Thank you, Councilor Sherman. Anything else? I would just add to that <clears throat> or second that I think we had a full slate of interviews that night. We had close to 30 people. I think we interviewed. It was very hard to make the decisions. It was a pleasure to have so many people come out and show so much enthusiasm <clears throat> to work on behalf of the various committees for the town. Very hard to make our choices. We had terrific options. We are very fortunate and capable of us to have such wonderful applicants. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor of accepting uh, the appointments, nominations. It's unanimous. Item number 50, annual budget. I'm going to turn this over again to our town manager. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Sullivan. Uh, you have before you the proposed uh, budget. Uh, we're going to be having a finance committee meeting under the leadership of Council Walsh next Monday, and look forward to beginning to review the budget then. Is there a motion on item number 50? Council Walsh. I move that uh, the town of Cape, the town of Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby refer or takes the referral of the town manager's proposed fiscal year 2015 budget to the Finance Committee. Is there a second? Council Wagner. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. <clears throat> and another opportunity 
is uh, now before us for citizens to discuss an item not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to do so? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number 51. We are uh, proposing to go into executive session. Is there a motion? Councilor Sherman. Uh, I move that we enter into executive session in conformance with 1 MRSA section 405, 6, A, and F to continue the evaluation of the town manager and to consider our request for a poverty abatement under 36 MRSA section 841. Is there a second? Councilor Ray. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. So we now move into executive session. Uh, while you're moving, this woman coming to the floor is Kelly Bouchard, and she is the new reporter for the Press Herald to be covering Cape Elizabeth. So, welcome. Thank you. We we go into ex we're in executive session now. We're going to a different okay. room.